I invite you to take your Bible this morning and turn to the book of Romans. We are in Romans chapter 8. We're going to be completing uh, this chapter today. And I don't know if you're counting chapters, but you'll notice that uh, we're halfway there. We're halfway through our study in Romans. There's 16 chapters, and I believe 8 is half of 16, so we're going to be coming to that halfway point this morning. So follow along as I read verses uh, 28 to uh, the end of the chapter, verse 39. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 28. Paul says this, he says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among all many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, uh, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What should we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You know, as, as we continue our study of the book of Romans this morning, we come to really a, a very exciting uh, passage of Scripture that deals with the safety and security that we have as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to see this morning uh, the guarantee of our eternal security was ordained by God before the foundation of the world. Now, to show us just how safe and secure we really are, Paul sets forth three main areas of truth for our consideration. You have them on the back of your bulletin on the outline that we're going to be following here this morning. Uh, let's look at them first of all. First of all, the purpose of God in verses 28 to 30, where Paul says, because of God's divine purpose, we are secure. And then secondly, the character of God in verses 31 to 34, where Paul says, because of who God is, folks, we're secure. And then the third one is the love of God in verses 35 to 39, where Paul says, because nothing can separate us from the love of God, folks, we're secure. And so as Christians, you and I are safe and secure because of God's purpose, because of God's character, and because of God's love. So let's look at the very first guarantee of our safety and security in Jesus Christ, and that's the purpose of God, the purpose of God in our lives as believers. Look at verse 28 again. Paul says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now we see here in verse 28 that God is working all things together for good. But not for everyone. Not for everyone. 
Paul says it's only for them that love God, for them who are the called according to his purpose. You see, there are two qualifications for any of us to have God working all things together for good in our lives. First of all, that we love God. And then secondly, that we've been called to salvation by God. And, and you know, before any of us can truly love God, we first need to be called by God for salvation. Amen? Be before we came to Christ, let me tell you, we did not love God. We couldn't love God. How can you love somebody that you don't know, right? In fact, for many of us, maybe even most of us, before we came to Christ, we, we hated God. We despised God. We never sought after God. We didn't want God. Now, why do we all of a sudden now have the capacity to love God? Well, because he first loved us. God first purposed to love you and me, and then he called us to return our love to him. Otherwise, none of us could, could possibly love him. It begins first with God calling us to salvation, loving us first so that we now can love him in return. Uh, if you remember back in chapter 3, Paul says this in verse 11, he says, There is none that seeketh after God. No one seeks after God. Jesus said it himself, he says, for the Son of Man has come, what? To seek and to save that which was lost. The shepherd has to come after the sheep. The sheep don't go searching for the shepherd, right? In John 6, Jesus says that no man can come to me except what? Except the Father draw him. And so Paul says that based upon God first loving us, loving us to salvation, and our responding love to him, now all things are working together for good for us. Now the reason that all things are working together for good for the believer is in verse 29. Paul says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. God's desire, folks, for you and for me is that we be conformed to the very image of Christ. And that's God's predestined, predetermined purpose for each one of us, that we be conformed to the image of his dear son. That's God's plan for you, folks. That's God's plan for me. You say, well, yes, okay, but is this 100% guaranteed and certain for me? I mean, is there any possible way that somehow I might be left out of the picture somewhere along the way? How safe and secure am I in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, verse 30 gives us the answer, gives us our security. Look at it. Verse 30, moreover whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, then he also justified. And whom he justified, then he also glorified. My friends, do you see any leakage at all in that plan that God has for us? Is there any room there for any of us to fall out of that plan, to fall through the cracks? Not a chance. You know, I, I really love what Jesus said in John 10 when he said that no man is able to pluck him out of my hands. No man. Now, folks, Jesus said that. No one's able to pluck any of us out of his hands. That includes you and me. We cannot pluck ourselves out of his hands. If you've truly been saved, truly been born again, you are truly a child of God, no matter what you do, no matter how bad you go uh, down the wrong path, you cannot pluck yourself out of his hand. You cannot lose your salvation. If it's genuine salvation in Jesus Christ, you can't lose it. No man, including yourself, can pluck us out of his hand. And when God decides to conform someone to the image of his dear son, that's a sovereign decree from God before the foundation of the world, a decree that cannot be foiled. Well, let's look at five unbreakable links that comprise the chain 
of our security in Jesus Christ. You know, when you think of a chain, a heavy chain, uh, an unbreakable chain, that you wrap it around something to keep it safe and to keep it secure. And you think of those links, there's no way that you can pull them apart. I mean, they're safe, they're strong, they're secure. And that's the chain that God has around our salvation. Our safety and security in Jesus Christ is bound by this chain. Let's look at the, the different links of the process of our salvation that keep us safe and secure in him. Verse 29 is the first link in that chain. And, and Paul says, for whom he did foreknow. Whom he did foreknow. Now, to know someone in the scripture uh, implies an intimate love relationship. Adam knew his wife and she bare a son, right? Abraham knew his wife and she bare a son. And so in the context of our passage here in Romans, for God to foreknow us means that God loved us even before the foundation of the world. Certainly before we came to Christ, he loved us. Before we were born, he loved us. Before the foundation of the world, he saw us. He loved us. And so we as Christians are objects of a predetermined love relationship with God from eternity past. Okay? Now, link number two is also in verse 29, where Paul says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did, what's the next word? predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, to predestinate is to determine from the start what the outcome will be, like the election last November, right? But in this case, this is a lot better to think about. In this case, the outcome that God predetermined, the outcome was our conformity to Christ. In other words, God predetermined in eternity past that we would be conformed to the image of Christ, that we would become more and more like Jesus day by day. Don't resist it, folks. That's his plan for you. That's his plan for me. Link number three, verse 30. He says, moreover whom he did predestinate, them he also, what? Called. To be called by God simply means to be chosen by God for salvation. 1 Corinthians 1.9, God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, you are one of God's called ones. One of his chosen ones to receive Salvation through Jesus Christ. And then link number four, also in verse 30, he says, In whom he called, them he also, what? Justified. To be justified simply means to be declared righteous in God's sight. Now, I, you might be wondering, uh, why are all these links in the past tense. Have you noticed that? They're all in the, in the past tense. Well, this is what's known as an idiom. Not idiot, an idiom, okay? I, 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 you know, and I, I've shared several times with you that the New Testament in its entirety was written originally in, in the Greek language, okay? The Koine Greek language. And every time that the Greeks wanted to say something, that was so sure that it could never be changed, they said it in the past tense, even though the thing hadn't actually happened yet. It was such a sure thing that it was put in the past tense as if, as if it had already happened. Well, here the Holy Spirit does the same thing. When he says that we are foreknown, we are predestinated, we are called, we are justified, before the foundation of the world, folks, all these things were set in motion for you and for me by, by God. And then there's a fifth link in the end of verse 30. He says, in whom he justified them, he also, what's the word? Glorified. Now, again, we're not glorified yet, uh, but in the mind of God, folks, we're glorified, right? Right? God sees you in the, the image of Jesus Christ, although in reality we're not 
quite there yet, and we all know that, right? We haven't arrived, right? But we will someday when we are with him, when we are raptured, when we are in his presence, never to be separated from him ever again, uh, we will be glorified in that day, okay? But the Holy Spirit speaks of your glorification and mine as if it's already happened. Folks, that's security. That's a guarantee. It's as good as done, amen? And so Paul says, you want a guarantee of your salvation and your standing in Christ? Just look at God's purposes in saving you. Well, Paul says there's a second security uh, that we have, and that's in the character of God in verses 31 to 34, where Paul shows us that because of all that God is, you and I are safe and secure in him as believers in Christ. And here, Paul poses four questions uh, to show the character of God. Let's look at each one of them individually. First one's in verse 31. Uh, Paul says, what shall we say then to, to these things? Here's the question. If God be for us, what? Who could be against us? Now, that's a good question. If God is for us, who can be against us? My friends, when, when God is for me, uh, when God's power is working in my behalf, not even Satan himself can touch me. If God is for me, and, and he is, if God is for you, and he is, then no one can come against us, not even all the forces of hell combined in the universe. <laughs> awesome thing to know. And so what Paul was saying here, and again, combining this whole chapter 8 together, some of the things that we've heard, that we've seen, that we've learned over the last couple of weeks here in chapter 8. If God has delivered us from the power of sin and death, and he has, if God has granted us the privilege of being his beloved, if God has renewed us by the Holy Spirit, he's come in and made all things brand new. If God recognizes us as his own, if God has made us joint heirs with Jesus, we, we saw that last week. If God has predestinated us to holiness and glory, man, who's going to mess with that? <laughs> If God's done all this for you and I as believers in Christ, who in the universe can mess with that? The character of God is power in our lives. And if God is for us, then who should we fear? Right? The second question Paul asked is this, verse 32. He says, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Here's the question. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? What a verse. Look at it again. <laughs> if he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, he gave his son to die for us. <laughs> How shall he not with him also freely give us all things. Paul is simply saying here that if God gave his unspeakable, indescribable gift of salvation to us while we were yet sinners, don't you think he's going to pour out even the lesser gifts in our lives now that we're his children? Do you think he's going to withhold anything from us now that we're his children? when he gave us the greatest gift of all, the gift of his son, the gift of salvation, while we were still vile, wretched, ugly sinners. Not a chance. Not a chance. Friends, when you think about all that God gave us in the person of his blessed son, Jesus Christ, on the cross of Calvary, just imagine what he's got in store for us in our eternal lives with him boggles the mind. Question number three, in verse 33, here's the question. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. 
In other words, who's going to accuse God's elect of anything? See, God has already declared in the highest court in the universe that I am righteous in Jesus Christ and that you are righteous in Jesus Christ so that not even Satan himself can make any accusation against me or you that's going to stick. God has declared us righteous. There's no higher power, no, no higher declaration than that coming from God. Not because of my righteousness or yours, we know what that's like, but because of Christ's righteousness in us. Romans 8.1, if you remember back about three weeks, we saw this verse, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation, period, for those that are in Christ Jesus. So who's going to accuse you after you've been set free and declared righteous by the highest court in the universe? <laughs> no one. No one. That's the answer. No one. I don't know about you, but I'm getting blessed here. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, let's look at question number four, verse 34. Here it is. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who is also making intercession for us. Paul asks the question, who's going to condemn you? you know, like, who's going to condemn you? Who's going to start dragging all your sins in front of you to condemn you? Well, there's only one that could do that, and that's Jesus Christ. Do you think he would? I mean, after all Jesus did on the cross... Dying in your place and mine, shedding his blood to wash away your sins, dying so that he could declare us righteous, so that he could declare us in right standing with God the Father, because he bore our sins. He's the only one that could. There's no way that he would do that. He's done too much for us to make us righteous, to justify us, to condemn us. And so Paul says that we are safe and secure, no doubt about it, because of the purpose of God, because of the character of God. And then there's one other thing that makes us safe and secure in Christ, and, and that's the love of God. The love of God. And, and we'll, just, we'll just read these, uh, these verses. Verse 35. Paul says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or Distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Verse 36, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Now here's, here's the answer, verse 37. Nay, in all these things we are, I love this, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. That phrase, more than conquerors, in the Greek, hupernikeo, hupernikeo, and it literally means super conquerors. Folks, we're not only conquerors in Christ, we are super conquerors. Nothing in this world can separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing. Paul lists a number of possibilities, but none of them can do that. Why? Well, because we've been made super conquerors as believers in Christ. And then verses 38 and 39 close the chapter. Paul says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. To sum it all up, simply this. Paul says that God has predetermined by his foreknowledge in eternity past a love relationship with you and me. He signified it by the gift of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. His death, burial, and resurrection was for us. And there's nothing, not a thing in the universe that can change 
the invincible purpose of God in your life or mine as believers in Him. Folks, we are safe and we are secure in Jesus Christ. Amen?